on the front we had a uh, prickly pear cactus and so the ufo comes down and blasts a nice kind of like soft neon green tractor beam um towards what was our armadillo and our prickly pear cactus and so some somehow in the process our prickly pear cactus are converted to magic mushrooms and not only are they converted to magic mushrooms but the <laughs> the ufo is harvesting the magic mushrooms and, and ripping them out of the ground, presumably to take back to um, whatever planet that they're from that doesn't have their own version of magic mushrooms. They were always going to come for our resources. We knew that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Shoecast. Welcome to the Stitch Down Shoecast, where we talk quality footwear, how it's made, and all the things we love about it. I'm Ben from stitchdown.com, and today we're quite excited indeed to be chatting with Graham Ebner, who is, and he would likely claim to disagree with this, because he's a swell guy, but I'm going to say it anyway. Kind of the next big thing in bespoke cowboy boots. We've made it a goal over here this year to figure out a ton about cowboy boots, how they're made, the incredible and uniquely American history behind them, all that. Uh, We had a blast talking with Lisa Sorrell, one of the all-time greats in the field last season. Um, Go check that episode out. It's one of our all-time favorites. And we can't wait to chat with Graham to get in even deeper today. But before we get to Graham, we just need to give a special shoe cast shout out to our sponsor this week, Grant Stone. While you're waiting 600 years to buy a pair of boots from Graham, check out Grant Stone's boot shoes and some of our favorite loafers in the entire game over at grantstoneshoes.com. Also, if you love boots and shoes, the makers who create them, and the community who loves them as much as you, you'd really better come to Stitchdown's Boot Camp, the biggest makers and community event ever maybe why not uh happening this october 6th and 7th in brooklyn new york we're rounding up a global crew of our favorite makers for a true world's fair of boots and shoes where you can learn more than you ever thought get expertly sized and spend time with the people behind some of the greatest footwear in the world we'll also be hosting viberg's yearly sample sale at the event the whole two days are going to be an absolute blast very affordable tickets are on sale now at stitchdown.com We'll see you in October. All right, it's time. We've got bespoke cowboy boot maker Graham Ebner live from Austin, Texas, the least likely place ever to make cowboy boots in the entire world. Graham, welcome to the Shoecast. How's it going? And what may I ask, are you wearing on your feet today? Hey, uh, it's good. Yeah, just uh, hanging out in the shop, having a beer, talking about shoes and boots and stuff. Um, (laughs) I am wearing... uh, Saucony um, mushroom lifestyle sneakers, I guess. I just got these the other day. They're pretty cool. They're vegan. They're made out of like some sort of recycled mushroom material, which I think is pretty interesting. And um, yeah, first pair of tennis shoes that I've had in a very, very long time, aside from like, I don't know, low skate vans or maybe my Hoka running shoes. What do you think of the mushroom? They're great. Yeah. I mean, I think they're super comfortable. The like fact that they're made out of I don't know, recycled or whatever biological material um, is pretty cool. And they have a, they have like a little embroidered, see this, but little guy right there on the tongue. Little shroom. Mm Mm-hmm, little shroom, which has been kind of on my mind lately with some other stuff that I've been making. So yeah, I'm stoked on. Well, first, yeah, thanks for, you know, coming on doing this in your workshop, uh, especially from a video perspective. One of the things that we've always lamented is that we can see the guests in their shop and their tools and, and what they're working on, but the listeners haven't been able to. So this is great. Um, I harangued you into bringing all sorts of stuff to show them, including hopefully those alien shroom boots that you just posted pics of. Do you have them? These things are remarkable. He, the, the customer has not picked them up yet. So luckily I've still got them in the shop. Which has been great for me because I've had a couple of people in here the last couple of days, so I could um, show them off, which is pretty rare. What's the story with these things? I've just been looking at them over and over on Instagram. Those pictures are beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, my friend um, Sam Bryant um, took those photos for me. We set up in, in his studio, and um, I was really, really excited because typically I'm like taking, I have like a little photo box, and I take photos with my iPhone or whatever, and they they turn out fine, but. Um, these boots were like an exceptional project for me and something I really wanted to show off. So um, really glad I got some great pictures of them. But um, yeah, so this guy came to me. He's a friend of another customer and his family's been in Austin for a long time. And he said, I want something kind of Texas-y, 
he had seen a like a boot box that I illustrated and and had made up for my customers when they picked their boots up. He was like, I want something kind of like the box and then something Texas-y <laughs> or like old Austin or whatever. He was like, I don't know. That's Beyond, when you know you got a good box. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was it was fun because like the box was my illustrations and something I had fun with. And he saw that and he was like, man, I just, I kind of want that, you know? But beyond that, he was like, go for it, do whatever you want. So these are a mixture of like calf, kangaroo, um, kid, um, baby calf. And so see the front here. This is, um, this is the Santa Elena Canyon, which is, a like a feature in big bend national park out here in Texas, which is one of my favorite places. It's arguably the most iconic spot in big bend, at least for me. So I, I decided, I was like, okay, I want something very Texas-y. I want something kind of deserty. Like we'll go with Santa Elena. I mean, I'd kind of had UFOs on the brain too. So it was like, man, I can't just be a desert scene. So I have, uh, entrance of our little friend UFO up here in the top corner. And this guy is like metallic kid, gold and, and silver. Um, and so this UFO is just kind of floating up here in the top. And then we've got a uh, prickly pear cactus down here in one corner popping up. And then we've got uh, armadillo here chilling on the other side. He's just kind of like watching, seeing what's going on, looking at the water, maybe just thinking about taking a dip. I wanted like some play between the front and the back panels on these because I think a lot of times inlaid cowboy boots end up looking like clip art. You know, there's like things are a bit disjointed and they're just kind of like thrown onto the tops and there's not really like, um, I don't know, any relationship between the things that you're seeing. So we flip it around and we've got a whole nother scene, right? So our, cl- our, our sky was a nice baby blue before so we turn around and we've got this like deep orange sherbet. The sky's looking ominous. Our clouds are black. Our horseshoe has like split. And so our UFO comes down. And this part is kind of um, up for interpretation. But so on the front, we had a uh, prickly pear cactus. And so the UFO comes down and blasts a nice kind of like soft neon green tractor beam um, towards what was our armadillo and our prickly pear cactus. And so some, somehow in the process, our prickly pear cactus are converted to magic mushrooms. And not only are they converted to magic mushrooms, but the, <laughs> the UFO is harvesting the magic mushrooms and, and ripping them out of the ground, presumably to take back to um, whatever planet that they're from that doesn't have their own version of magic mushrooms. They were always going to come for our resources. We knew that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a bit like alchemy, I guess. You know, they're like, they're changing something that we have a lot of into something that's like pretty special. So our, um, our armadillo is chilling over here and he, uh, he's getting blasted by the tractor beam too. He was just sitting on, kind of on the banks and now he's, he's floating up in the air. He's on his back. Um, and I don't know if you can see this, but like he is, um, he's having a great time. You know, he's pretty happy. He's got a <laughs> smile on his face. Like he's about to go for a grand adventure, um, into another world. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. This, like, I had a great time making these, and I wish that like, every pair that I made could be something like this. Um, meaning, I love doing inlay. I like doing really intricate stuff. Don't get me wrong. Like, I love doing classic top stitching, kind of like what people think of when they think of a cowboy boot. For me, like, this, this allows me to mix my other interests, which is like, you know, drawing and illustration and like other forms of artistry um, to, to mix those things with cowboy boot making. And, so it's like I have an idea and I, I get to sit down and I draw it. And then not only do I have to be able to draw it, but then I have to be able to make it out of leather, which just adds like a whole new dimension to like whatever the design is that I want to create. It was definitely a challenge on this to get all that done. And there's like, I don't remember, like 60 or so individual pieces um, on each panel of all the different colors. And they just, you know, one by one, they get stacked and they kind of come together. It's definitely the the coolest thing that I've ever made. I'm pretty excited about it. I hope I get to do some more stuff like that. We also must note that this was before, uh, you know, some government turncoat has uh, admitted that there's like a warehouse full of alien craft somewhere. It's but like it's like two days ago that came out in the news. You were way out ahead of it. <laughs> yeah, they actually asked me. Um, I do a little bit of like government PR, and they asked if I could. Um, maybe kind of soften the blow a little bit by bringing attention to, to things like this. So um, I think that with a little bit of Instagram traffic, I was able to <laughs> accomplish that for them. 
uh, it's like you know pertinent but also a distraction um which is what they always want exactly you know what i mean if this is how the game is played it worked out because these boots are just astonishing man like they're so cool they're so cool Thank you, thank you. And they fit, too, which is um, arguably the most important part. I definitely had the thought, I don't know if he's really going to wear them, like, or are they just going to end up on the shelf in his house, which, to be honest, I'm totally okay with. If somebody came to me and they were like, hey, I want something crazy. I'm never going to wear them. They are going to be sculpture or whatever. I'm going to put them up on my shelf in my living room. Let's do it. Absolutely. I don't care. Because I've got stuff like that at my house, too, or I have a shelf of boots right here next to me in my shop. And, um, you know, I like pretty stuff to look at and i love looking at vintage cowboy boots and but um he's gonna wear these a lot and uh really he told me the other day yeah he ordered another pair kind of uh, i'm not gonna say similar but um we had a similar interaction where he said hey i have this one idea um and that's all i'm gonna give you what can you do with that what can you come up with like just go for it you know have fun i'm grateful for that too you know they're pretty um I think that uh, I'm really happy with my work, which is saying something for me. But uh, I'm I'm glad that he's going to enjoy them not not just looking at them at home, but actually wear them out out and about. How much of this design and that story, like that very legitimate story that is baked into them, was the customer, and and how much was you? Like, what was that process like? Um, yeah, this is all me. And there's a photo of these boots sitting on the box, which. Um, Kind of makes sense. You kind of see the story jump from the box to the boots, which is cool. And that wasn't my intention when I made the box. I was just like, hey, these are things that I'm interested in. I love to draw. I definitely like, you know, kind of cartoonish illustration. And I really need a boot box. And lots of makers that charge a lot of money for boots. When you pick them up, they hand you the boots and you walk out the door and that's it. And um I don't know. I just kind of wanted a little bit of a more well-rounded experience for people. And like I found a pair of um, vintage Acme's at a garage sale here in town. And, uh, you know, Acme's are really cool, but they are not um, the pinnacle of quality when it comes to like vintage cowboy boots for the most part. But they had great branding. And um, anyway, so this pair of boots had the original box from like 1950 or 1960 with the boots. I was like, this is insane. That not only are these boots still around, but they still have their like original box and sales receipt um, with them. Yeah. And I was like, man, okay, <laughs> twelve bucks. Like in, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like in you know fifty or sixty years, if if uh, somebody comes across a pair of my boots, it would be really cool if they still had the box. So I thought, well, I'll, I want to make it attractive enough that people will want to hold on to it, you know, and display it. It's kind of big, so they need a kind of a big spot on their shelf, but that's, you know, that's not my problem. So, um, I drew the box and yeah, he, uh, he really gave me kind of carte blanche to do whatever he said, you know, do something Texasy and go for it. And, um, basically what he said, he was like, don't put a bunch of weed or like pot leaves or anything on that because like I don't smoke and I don't want to have to like explain that to my wife. I was like, okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so let's put on something that could just be construed as normal old mushrooms. Exactly. Which is yeah. what the aliens really came for. They're just hungry. Yeah. Yeah. He was excited and he was into the mushrooms and like the imagery that, that went along with those. Um, so um, I wish every customer was like that and they would just come and, and say, you know, here's a loose idea of something that I'm interested in. Go for it. You know, it surprised me. And that was really challenging. And I, and I had a bunch of different ideas and spent a ton of time sitting down and drawing and you know at that time i was still working out of my house so i'd go to the library and and you know take my ipad or my pad and pencil and stuff and i'd sit there and draw for like four or five hours like every day for a week and just until i kind of got a little bit of a heading on where i wanted to go and then as that idea started to form things kind of came into view and and then i came across a photo of santa elena um and have been there a handful of times. And I was like, oh, this is like, this is it. This is perfect. Like, this is the scene that I need to build. Man. Yeah. I'm like such a big believer in, you know, these, the boots that we love and the shoes that we love, you know, they're nice. And the way that they're made is really interesting. That story and, you know, how these kind of techniques emerged is fantastic. And, you know, with certain brands and companies, especially the ones that have been around for a long time and, you know, kind of what they meant, like, it's not just how they look and how they 
fit and how they feel, but the stories behind them. But that's like a bigger picture story, you know, like to take that and then to to bake in like some real well thought out literal storytelling into this boot is I don't know, man, it's cool. It's like it's it's a different level. I guess if somebody asked me, like, what what is it that I want to add to this? That's it. Like cowboy boots have a really long history of being you know, really wild and over the top. Um, but the last I don't know, maybe 20, 25 years, I would say things have gotten a lot more subdued, especially with like different factory styles and whatnot. But if you go back and you look at the cowboy boot books and you look at stuff from the 1940s or, or you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, the inlay, like the artistry that, that you see in those photos is just tremendous. And like the sky was the limit. Like they were making absolutely crazy stuff. And I look at that and I was like, man, like this is my inspiration. Like I love these things, um, you know, and they, you could look at like a nudie suit, um, you know, kind of like the vintage embroidered Western wear kind of stuff that all the old Western stars were wearing. And, and like the imagery that you were seeing on those were really similar to what they were putting on boots at the time. And so when I was, you know, kind of coming up in this and, and learning, like we made a lot of crazy stuff at the shop. Like I was really lucky to get to work on a lot of intricate artistic boots so when i eventually went out on my own and i was thinking you know like what's my what's my thing you know like i'm a good boot maker i understand this i can do good work but like what do i add to this it was like i don't know i guess it's me like i want to add like my artistic take on whatever it is and just use cowboy boots as kind of a canvas you know like i want to draw i want to paint and then take those ideas and make a boot out of it um which at least in my mind, that's what those early makers were doing. You know, like it was, they were making cowboy boots, but like they were making art more than anything. And like, that's the most interesting thing to me. I'm pretty sure you've only been at this for like five years or something. Can you just take us through it? I, uh, I grew up wearing boots. Um, I am solidly from the suburbs. I'm going to make that very clear. I am not a cowboy. <laughs> I did not grow up on a ranch. I did. My, I, my dad had a couple of horses loosely when I was a kid. Um, so I did ride a fair amount and, and did some stuff like that, but I am firmly from the suburbs. Were you wearing cowboy boots? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I, I grew up next to like a big equestrian facility, but like, like I said, you know, like in the burbs for sure. And, uh, I, I sewed like my grandmother taught me to sew, um, and we would make clothes or quilts. She was a big quilter still is. Um, and I loved it. I loved making stuff like we would go over to her house, you know, I don't know, five times a week or whatever. And we lived with them for a while and we would just sew. That's all we would do. So eventually, um, this was like 2014. I had a pair of, uh, Red Wing Iron Rangers that had just fallen apart. Insole had like ripped out, you know, like the gemming had come off the, the insole. And I had no idea what was going on on the inside of this thing. And I was desperately trying to figure out how to fix them. And internet resources were kind of scarce at that point. I was calling shoe repair shops and asking if they could replace the insoles on these. And they were just like, nah, that's not really how it works. It's not worth it, whatever. And I am a tinkerer and a tear it apart, put it back together kind of person at heart. And I was like, well, forget it. Like, I can do this. So I didn't. Um, I just continued to, like, you know, <laughs> obsess over uh, the few resources that there were on the internet. Um, and Eventually, like after looking through um, Lisa Sorrell's videos, which were a huge thing at the time for me, uh, watching all like the boot life stuff. There's so many of them. They're so good. Oh my God. And it's like, you know, there were some resources, but it was like a cowboy boot forum, right? So a bunch of, you know, old boot makers or whatever, people who thought they were boot makers. Um, it, those are two separate categories. There are a lot of good boot makers on the forum. <laughs> um you know, they're posting things, but if you don't have any context for what they're talking about and what the processes look like, it doesn't really do you any good, right? So I'm watching a boot life video. I am devouring um, Brian the Bootmaker's Instagram at the time because he was doing a ton of repair, um, especially then. And I and he posted a lot of like in-depth progress photos. This is how I'm, you know, preparing my insole. This is what I'm doing with my welting. You know, this is how I'm, you know, using a jerk needle to in inseam. And so I kind of, I don't know, built a very basic education from all of these things. And I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fix these boots myself. And if I can do this and I like it, 
then I'm going to go find somebody to teach me. So I did it. I got them put back together. I, I uh, put a new insole in them. I rewelted them, put soles on. I think I ordered some like raw cord uh, half soles from Dr. Soul, uh, which I still have a couple of pairs of actually from that first time I ordered them. I sewed them in my living room. I stabbed myself in the thumb with a jerk needle and it caught and I had to like cut it out of my thumb it was wild, but I had a great time and I finished them and I wore them and I was like, this is it, man. I am having like such a good time. I've got to find somebody to teach me how to do this. So I Googled like boot shop and I, and I lived like, um, right on the South Congress area in Austin, which is like kind of our main drag. I, uh, the closest shop that came up was a place called Texas traditions and I had no idea what it was. And I was looking for some sticky wax for inseaming threads because i had one more pair that i was going to try and fix myself like a pair of chippewa engineer boots so i called and they didn't answer i left a voicemail and i said hey you know my name's graham i'm trying to learn how to make boots can you sell me some stuff and i was like they're never calling me back i don't know an hour later uh lee miller who owns a shop called me back and he was like hey come by you know i've got plenty of stuff and i'll i'll help you out whatever so I went over there, he kind of gave me the tour and gave me some, just a bunch of findings, you know, some like inseaming threads, um, like tapered hand threads, some sticky wax. And, and I went home and I kind of kept at it for a little while. And then I kept going back because I was like, okay, here's somebody that's willing to teach me. And, and after I went, I was like, I started doing some research and I was like, holy shit, like this place is amazing. Like this is the <laughs> place. This isn't just a, this isn't a shoe repair shop, number one. Like this is the cowboy boot shop. And it is, whatever, a mile and a half from my house. So I was working at a coffee shop and a motorcycle shop at, this, at that time. Um, and I, I said, hey, you know, I, I want to learn how to do this. Can you teach me? And he said, no. <laughs> He's like, I don't have time for that. Um, but if you can, maybe if you can get a grant or something like that from an arts foundation, um, and there was one that they had worked with, then maybe we can make it happen. So... Tried to do that. They started letting me come in a couple afternoons a week after I'd get off my shift at the coffee shop. And um, I didn't get the grant, but they didn't kick me out. I hung around and took up their time and screwed stuff up a couple afternoons a week for like six months, I think. I don't know. Labor Day 2017 is my, was my first day. And I went part-time, I think, in the spring of 2018. Eventually, like, I don't know, a few weeks in, they, Lee was like, okay, you know, you're, you're picking this up. Um, I wasn't quite as much of a burden at that point. And so I was doing repair work. Um, and really from that point, um, they, they eventually hired me part-time. And then I went full-time, like, pretty quick after that. And I just did all the repair. And I mean all of it. Because, like, TT's been in business for, like, whatever, 50 years. And they only do repair on boots that they've made for the most part. So just think about how many pairs of boots that is. Like, I, I, I have no idea. I don't know. Like, no one could know unless they spent, you know, just hours going back over the books. But there's a lot of boots that need to be fixed. So I just started after it. Soles and heels, bottoming, inseaming, patching, you know, putting sideliners in, whatever. Then I started doing refoots. You know, somebody come in and their dog ate the foot off of their, off of their cowboy boots. So I'd, I learned how to crimp. And I'd start doing, you know, refooting a pair of boots and then so you know side seam them by hand putting them back together and then you know i'd start doing top repairs like somebody's dog ate a whole half of one boot, and you know so i had to kind of like cut it away and rebuild a half of one front panel and make it look like it had never happened and that sort of stuff and i still believe that if anyone wants to learn how to make boots or make shoes that they should learn how to do repair first that's just my opinion but the stakes are low um, and you get an opportunity to do as good of work as you can do um, in like a really low stress environment. And you get to see like how people before you did it. You know, I got to like be an archaeologist of cowboy boots at that point. You know, I was working on boots from like, I think the earliest pair that I worked on were probably from 77. And the guy was still wearing them. And I eventually refooted them in. I don't know, 2019. It's like, this is insane. Like, these are still in good shape. And, you know, it's not like you buy a pair of custom boots and you're like, okay, these are literally going to last me my entire life without me ever taking care of them. Like, that's not how it works. It's just like, you know, when you first get into like raw denim or something, and you're like, oh, these are this amount of money. So like, they're going to last me so much longer than a pair of 501s. It's like, well, that's not really the point. And that's, you know, they're good quality, but like, that's, you're kind of missing it here. And the thing with, 
like a well-made pair of boots or shoes or whatever is that they are like infinitely repairable, right? Because the materials are good. The workmanship is good. So like any of these boots that have been made over the years, I can tear them down and I can replace the insole or I can just replace the toe box and leave the vamps and then rebuild the, sh- the boot from the inside out and people can keep wearing them for years. And then, you know, in another 20 years, they can bring them back and we can do it again. And, you know, just replace the vamps at that point, or replace the pull straps or whatever. All that to say is like by the time I got around to doing top work, it's like I had done everything else and I felt confident enough that my work was good. Um, and uh, so it was like I just got the chance to be creative at that point or learn how to sew a new pattern or whatever. And so how long was that? 2020, I think. And the last pair that I made there were my second favorite pair that I've ever made. And really, I think the pair that made me most excited about making these Big Ben boots. And they were an homage to the nudie suit that Graham Parsons had made for him in like, I think, 1969. Um, And it was, uh, you know, kind of like a bone or white color. And it had... um, like LSD tabs and pills and like marijuana leaves and flames. And just like this, it was just an insane suit, right? Like it's a very, it's a really famous piece. You can look up images of it, but I begged Lee to let me make those like for the couple of years that we were, you know, waiting for them to kind of get to the front of the line. So I finished those and, um, and I, and I will say, and I have to say that like everything at that shop was a collaborative effort, you know, Lee, is the owner um and like the master and so like we were all lucky enough to like have a great teacher and to learn the right way to do things and he was gracious enough to uh, allow us to like have a hand in in the actual process you know like in the big show of making a pair of boots for somebody that was paying a lot of money and had waited a long time to get them so he would do measuring and he would build lasts and he would do artwork most of the time, um, unless it was like, you know, maybe something easy, just a stitch pattern. And then he would hand it off um, to one of us, Charlotte or me, and we'd get after it. So I begged for, yeah, like two years to make those Graham Parsons boots because um, we'd listen to him a lot in the shop too. And I was so excited about it. And so when the time came, they, they uh, let me have my hand in making them um, along with Lee and, and, and Charlotte. Aside from these big Ben boots, that is my absolute second favorite pair of boots ever. Now it's time to strike out on your own. Yeah, pretty much. I just like hit that point where um, it was just like there was some life stuff, and and I was feeling restless, and I had turned thirty, and I was just kind of ready for something different. Um, it was an incredible place to learn to make boots, uh, and I'm very very lucky that I got to to learn there. I don't think, and this is just my personal opinion, but I I think a lot of people will agree with this, that it is, if not the, it is one of the absolute best cowboy boot making shops. I mean, I will say in the country, but like, you know, it's, there's not really that many outside of the US. So like, you know, in the world, Um, like Lee is up there with kind of our, our latest round of, of old guard, you know, like among, uh, you know, Lisa Sorrell or Eddie Kimmel or, um, I don't know, Jack Reed and uh, Ray Jones and all these other makers. Um, so I, I don't know. I just kind of woke up one day and I was like, man, I think I'm just ready to go. I need to do something for myself. I want to try this to see, I don't know, see what I'm made of and see the kinds of things that I can create. Um, I had a kind of a different vision for what I wanted my bootmaking career to look like compared to what the traditional model is. And when I say that, I mean... Most cowboy boot shops are custom shops. So you walk in and you have an idea. You want a pair of Dallas cowboy boots or you want a pair of Whataburger boots, you know, a fast food hamburger place, cowboy boots, whatever. It doesn't matter. I didn't want to do that. Like I didn't want to just make anything that people walked in with. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't mean that. Um, But it wasn't something that I was personally interested in. And I think when it comes to this, like you can... You can be excited about the quality of the work and the way that you execute something. And you can also be excited about like the art, um, the artistry and the design of what you're making, right? Sometimes you can be excited about both and sometimes you only get one. And I uh, had gotten to do both for a long time, um, for, you know, five years. Um, but there was a lot of stuff that I, I didn't enjoy making because, you know, it wasn't my personal style, right? 
And there's a lot of shops like that that exist where they will make you anything that you want and they'll do an incredible job of it, right? Like they will make they will make your dreams come true and you will be able to wear them on your feet. And I think that's a really cool thing. It's just not what I personally wanted to do. I wanted to find a way to like express my personal, I don't know, creative bend. So I wanted to have more control over the things that I was going to make. I love making traditional stuff. I love top stitching. I love a classic cowboy boot. And I make that. And I made, I mean, that's most of what I've made this last year. But stuff like this, the Big Ben boots, um, and a couple other pairs that I have coming up, like uh, I'm about to do a really heavy floral inlay. Um, I have some kind of, um, I don't know, kind of Day of the Dead boots coming up later this year. Um, things like this that are full of, I don't know, intentional design, um, things that you don't normally see on cowboy boots. It's like, that's what I wanted to do. Basically, I just wanted to draw and uh, get paid to like turn my drawings into cowboy boots for people who wanted them, which I'm trying to do, and it's working out so far. Love it, man. So one of the things that makes me, you know, especially this last year, just want to constantly learn more about cowboy boots is the, the craft and tradition and in some ways, like the mystery of all that. You can certainly learn to make cowboy boots in all sorts of ways these days, like including from the internet. I feel like from when you started, you know, the number of people that I know, not necessarily making cowboy boots, but, you know, just boots, um, who have learned exclusively online, you know, without any sort of tutelage, and they're making fantastic stuff. I feel like that's changed a lot, especially in the last, like, half decade, which is great. It is. Yeah, it's a good thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love it, and I've seen the results, and it's, like, it's it's kind of mind-boggling in a lot of ways but it also seems like there's this magic that gets transferred in those teacher student relationships the best versions of which stretch back multiple generations to some of the all-time greats that maybe can't be absorbed any other way like am i totally off base there i think that's probably the case with like a lot of craft or you know handcraft work whatever you want to call it um and, uh, you know, like I, like I said, I'm, I started off looking at the internet and I'm really grateful that there are resources for people now who want to get into this, but can't find someone to teach them because it's really hard. Like it is really hard to find someone who is willing to take time out of their schedule to teach you how to make something, you know, to take the, take you on the burden of your I don't know, ignorance or whatever, um, and show you how to do something like it's a big deal. And so like, if anybody is lucky enough to find an apprenticeship with somebody like thank that person, like to the end of time, because that's a huge thing. There's only so many people that know how to do this. And among those, there's only so many that have the time to teach and even fewer that want to, you know, things like the internet resources, like, uh, I don't know, the cord waning subreddit or, um, Dina McGuffin is like an incredible boot maker in New Mexico. And she teaches now. And has been for a while. That's like generally who I send people to if they're asking me where to learn, where to learn how to make cowboy boots. Like those are great resources. The internet is the internet is there, and it has pretty much everything that you would need to learn how to make a pair of cowboy boots from start to finish. But that doesn't that doesn't mean that you necessarily know what you're doing at the end of that pair, and that doesn't mean that you've done good work at the end of that pair. And sometimes the difference in like. I don't know, just completing the task and doing a really good job of it is just somebody to step to stand next to you and show you a couple of little tricks that their mentor taught them um, to like change, change the entire outcome of your project. I think like if, if people have the resources, the time and the money to go and learn from someone who's willing to teach like Dina, that is the best way to do it. There are people who are great bootmakers who are willing to take time to teach now. Um, you know, for to be clear, it's not like a free thing. Like you have to pay to be there for their time. But if you can't do it, the internet resources, like I said, like the cord waiting subreddit or um even just Instagram now, like there's a ton of makers that are on there that have maybe come up from I don't know, the Reddit. The resources, like the people that are in them, especially that are trying to teach themselves, like they are so excited to share their knowledge, right? Um uh, and I think that's I it's really cool. Like it's a really cool thing. Like I'm I am not a competitive person. I think if you want to make cowboy boots and you think you're going to be good at it, you should go for it and like put me out of business. That sounds great to me because I'm doing this because I love it. And if somebody else comes up and, you know, they've got a talent for it, um, I hope they can find someone to nurture that. But 
I, I really noticed um, maybe about a year and a half ago, there was one uh, user on the subreddit that I just kind of hit it off with. And he was asking me questions about how to make boots. And, and he had already been doing it for a little while. You know, he had used a couple of the how-to cowboy boot books and he had made a lot of progress and his stuff was looking good, but he was like, okay, I need a little help tweaking, I don't know, my last buildups or how do I adjust my heavy counter pattern to account for this or whatever. And at first I was like, man, I don't, I don't have time for this. Like I'm just getting off the ground. I don't even, I'm not qualified to do this. And then at some point I was like, ah, forget it. This is cool. Like the best way to learn something or to deepen your knowledge of it, right. Is to teach somebody else. And so we started talking all the time we FaceTime or, you know, Instagram DM or whatever. So I, I found the subreddit after that. And I was like, this is, I don't know. I feel like I just like walked into this like party that was hidden out of sight of all these people that wanted to learn to make boots and shoes. And I was like, Oh, these are my people. Like, I don't, I don't have, I mean, I have friends that make boots now, but like, I don't necessarily know a lot of people or didn't at the time who were like so eager that they were like, I'm going to look this up on the internet and I am going to learn how to do this no matter what, whatever resources are there. That's what I got. I'm going to do it. It's like, this is, this is so cool. Like, this is so cool that people are so excited about making footwear, whatever kind that they're willing to like invest their time and money and be like, Hey, strangers on the internet, look at this like crazy shoe that I just made. Help me make it not look like this, you know, help me make it look better. And then they, they do, you know? And then some of those people are like taking orders and like have become really good craftspeople at this point. And I, I don't know. I'm all about it. I think it's a really cool thing. I'm excited for the internet, for the resource that is the internet. That sounds like a ridiculous thing to say because obviously, but you know what I mean. I do, man. It's, <laughs> it's beautiful. It's all beautiful. Um, you term your boots, at least on your Instagram, simply really nice, really expensive. <laughs> I feel like coming from anyone else, that would be hugely pretentious maybe <laughs> yeah, but i think it still kind of you, is but <laughs> i i would say you somehow managed to make it quite charming but what, what does that mean to you why did you choose that oh uh, i appreciate that um so this kind of goes back to what i was saying about what i did and didn't want to make right i had like a pretty clear idea of where i wanted to head artistically um and in order to get there i felt like this all kind of stems from when i opened my books up last year and I, I felt like I wanted to be really clear with people because I wanted to kind of approach this with a different mindset being, I don't just make anything that you want to make. Um, I didn't want to have to turn people away because I really hate doing that. And so this is really out of self-preservation that I said, hey, look, I'm going to open my books. These are the things that I don't do. And these are the things that I want to do. This is how much stuff costs. These are all of the like nitty gritty pieces of information that people want to know. Like nine out of 10 times, if I get an Instagram DM, people are saying, how much do they cost? When are your books open? And I didn't want to like pass that question, you know, tell people, okay, they cost this much. I'm opening my books at this time, whatever. They take this long to make and then get to the point where they were like, cool, well, I want this thing on my boots. And then I would have to say, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm sorry. I can recommend you somebody else that would do that or whatever. I just decided to be really blunt, I guess. And, um, you know, as far as the price thing goes, like cowboy boots can really easily be looked at as kind of a commodity. Like you can go to a Western wear store or Walmart or whatever and spend, uh, I don't know, you could probably get a pair of like Justin Ropers for like a hundred bucks or something. Um, or you could go to a Western wear store, you know, we got a million of those here in town and you could spend, you know, two or 300 bucks, um, and walk away with something that you probably be at least mostly happy with for a while. On that note, I will say I am not anti factory boot. Like I am, uh, honest about how much my stuff costs, but I also know that they are really expensive. And for most people, that's not an amount they can afford to spend on a, you know, kind of a pair of like superfluous, but you know, boots. I'm never going to shit on factory boots. I'm excited if people wear cowboy boots and if they find a pair they like from a store that came from a factory, like, I think that's great. So most of the time, you know, you spend, you know, two or 300 bucks. Um, so people are asking me when I'm opening my books, Hey, how much are they going to cost? Three, four, $500. I was like, ah, oh, I hate this conversation. 
because I don't want to be like, oh no, not only are you off, but you're like $2,500 off because I, I look like an <laughs> asshole. And I don't, I hate that moment. Like I, I'm proud of what I make and I will stand behind my pricing. And I know Lisa talked a lot about this on her episode with you, her chat with you, but like this takes a lot of work. It's, they are really expensive to make. Materials are not cheap. Um, there's overhead. I have a ton of money and tools and equipment. Like it hurts a lot of the time, my hands and my wrists, and my elbows. And I've only been doing this for, what do we say? Six, not even six years. Like I'm torn up. I will stand behind my pricing, um, which is generally around 3000 um, bucks starting like base price. So I got really tired of having that conversation with people because not because I was like, oh, you have no idea what you're talking about, but mostly because I felt really uncomfortable because I just, I don't know, you know, when you try to negotiate with somebody and you're so far away from one another, it takes a lot of work to like, I don't know, explain or you know, find some common ground, I guess. Anyway, all that to say is when I went out on my own and I opened my books, I really wanted to be clear with people about who I was, what I was making what things cost and what they could expect from me because it's a lot easier on me to do it that way. And then nobody's upset when I have to tell them no and I don't have to like go through that process, which makes me very uncomfortable. I think I was like talking to a friend who was doing some branding work for me and he was asking me, okay, like what, like, what do you want to say about this stuff? You know, like what, like, what are you? Who are you as a bootmaker? Who's your, what's your business? You know? And I was like, I don't know, man. They're just like, they're really nice. They're really expensive. Like maybe, uh, and, and he was like, he's like, stop uh, what? And I was like, <laughs> Got Oh, it. Oh, I was like, that's it. That's it. And I was like, yeah, it's a little cheeky, but I kind of like that. And it's clear and it maybe is a little pretentious. I get that, but you know what? No one ever will walk in or like look at my Instagram or look at my box and think, uh, well, like they will have a clear idea of what's going on. You know, like I set expectations. Um, the stakes which, are set. Yeah. 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 Um, and they are really nice. So, you know, I stand behind it. In these messages, especially with that is, you know, the first thing they see before they message you, do you still get people balking at the price? Is that a conversation that you kind of lessened? Yeah, definitely. It has really mitigated that. Um, I don't, like, I think the pricing is still on my page, like from my, uh, books opening last year if you scroll way down but most of the time you know people look at what like your last nine posts or something and I don't have my website link in my bio at this point and so they're like there's not a lot of information admittedly um, and I'm working on that but at the very least they see really nice really expensive and um, so people that see that and still are curious about what's going on are usually really respectful and have an idea of what's going on um, as far as pricing. Um, and we can, you know, they shoot me a message and we can have a chat about it. And if it's something they're interested in, then I still have to tell them to wait because my books are closed at the moment, but it, uh, it helps. It really helps. And I, you know, I want people to be comfortable and I think it's helped with that. How long does it take to complete a pair of maybe, you know, quote unquote, normal boots and then something more complicated like the, the shroom alien boots. My base boot, which I consider to be like six rows of fancy stitching on the tops, um, 12 inches in height, kind of my standard heel height, um, no exotic leather, stuff like that, but design, just some top stitching, um, still custom fit and all that stuff, about 120 to 140 hours. Man, so that's like, you know, 3x what somebody making, you know, kind of a normal pair of lace up boots. Usually, like, the 40 hours is about the number that you'll hear from most bootmakers in, in that realm. Most cowboy bootmakers will tell you that too. And some of them are telling the truth. And some people work a lot faster than I do. Like, I'm not slow. You know, like, if I sat down with somebody that makes like two or three pair in a week and you said, okay, we're going to inseam these, go, like, they're not going to smoke me. Like, I'm, I'm, good and i'm i work at a reasonable pace but i'm new and i want everything that i put out to be like the absolute best that i can do you know and so i i do take extra time and i hope that i can get a little more efficient and get a little quicker at some point it's not my main focus though like i just want to make the absolute best pair of boots that i can make and so right now that takes me 
it, generally about three weeks. Like if it's just fancy stitching and the customer's foot isn't, um, does it require like, I don't know, anything special. It's not really confusing me or giving me a hard time. Then about three weeks, take a few days to set up the last kind of block everything out and, and, uh, you know, cut patterns and all that and, uh, grimp and then kind of hit it. But if it's crazy, like the sky's the limit, I guess. I think I had, I don't know, 200 and 225 or 240 or something like that. 240 hours or so in the big Ben boots. Um, but it's like, how do you measure that? Like a lot of that I had, I had time in artwork, which I'm not really including in that amount, but I probably had like 30 hours in artwork because I'm a slow drawer mostly, you know? Um, and then, you know, it took me three, four weeks to make the tops, I guess. Anyway, um, anywhere from, yeah, 120 to 220, 250 hours or so all said and done. Yeah. From a last perspective, how does that work with you? Do people have to come in, get measured, all that? Like, what, what's the process with the customer, especially? Yeah, so all, all of my stuff is made to fit. So everyone gets a last that is fit to them from the toe flower patterns, the top patterns, everything is made to fit, like that person's foot and their last. So people come here to my shop um, downtown Austin, and I measure them and take a kind of a combination of um, traditional and, and modern measurements, um, like an ink imprint, pedograph, pencil tracing, girth measurement, profiles of different things, basically like anything that I can think of to give me just a little bit of extra information for when the time comes that I set their last up. Because I can like I can look at somebody's foot and be like, oh, okay, I'm noticing that, you know, this person is here, I'm feeling their foot. It's like kind of a fleshy foot, or maybe they have like a really high instep or they have like a heel spur or whatever. But like in like three months when I start working on their last all of that information is gone, right? I don't remember right. what their feet look like. And I don't really <laughs> want to be like, hey, can I take a picture of your feet? Like, Maybe I should do that. That would actually be really helpful. Maybe I'll start doing that. I have to give myself every little bit of information um, that I possibly can so that I can give them the best fit in their pair of boots at the end. Because like, if they don't fit, unless they really just wanted a shelf piece, like, it doesn't matter. Like, That's my number one priority is, is to make them fit, to make them feel good to give them a pair of boots that they could, they could walk, you know, all over town and walk miles and miles, um, and still be comfortable without their feet hurting. So that is my goal. I know that you pulled out some tools for us, some of your favorites or most useful. What are you using there? What are your, how do you make these things and what gets it done? Okay. So these are what I like to call my close the shop down tools. So if any of these items go missing, I am very upset and I stop working. So first thing I've got is, um, this is my hammer. It is, uh, kind of like a French style hammer. So it has a long wide pane. Um, it has a fiberglass handle and a rubber grip. And if you look at my boot box, if you scroll down and look at the box, um, there's little medallions, you know, like in each corner of the top. And this hammer is one of those specific medallions. The hammer to me is this handle, um, with this grip only because when I started, uh, Lee gave me one of these and it was my hammer and it was really special. And so, uh, I just like grew an attachment to it, I guess. And there is something about this like rubber grip and the fiberglass handle that makes it feel really good when you're using it. And I spent a lot of time, you know, hammering on things very hard, um, with a lot of force. And so I have grown to like that hammer a lot. Second thing is I've got a pair of shank lasting pliers. Um, same thing. I, I, these are pretty busted at this point, honestly. And in the video, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but there's like a big chunk of silicon bronze, um, like soldering on top of these pliers because they broke the top jaw of these pliers broke. And, um, some, maybe people are familiar with how these work, but these are for lasting in the shank. And so, um, you kind of use this bottom tongue of the pliers as a lever. So if you're like grabbing the vamps on the lateral side of the boot, this kind of spoon shaped lever rests on the medial side and you use it to push against and it pulls the upper or whatever. So typically what happens is people start pulling on the uppers with these pliers and 
to kind of give a little extra pull and to push the pliers back down against the boot, they hit it on the top with a hammer. Well, if you hit it on top of the hammer, it's like old cast, like it breaks. So these were in a drawer at Lee's and I pulled them out of the like, I don't know, kind of tool graveyard drawer. And he was like, ah, if you can fix those, you can have one. So I took him to the motorcycle shop that I was working at and we, you know, fired the welder up and um, brazed them back together. And I've been using them for, I don't know, six years. And I would really like a nice new set, but there's really no point because there's nothing wrong with these. And, you know, they have a cool story. I have a pair of um, Berg lasting pliers, 501s, which are the big guys. There might be one size larger, but this, these are my favorite. I have um, a pair of the medium-sized ones, and I don't like them. These are pretty hefty. They've got real long legs. Um, the teeth are still nice and sharp on these. Um, so I kind of find myself really just grabbing, unless I'm like lasting uh, like around the toe or in the heel area. Um, like that's what I'm using all the time. And even then, sometimes I'll, I'll grab these. Okay, these two things, most special. So this is a lip knife. Um, it has this like bird's head handle on it. And um, it is a, it's a really short blade, it's stainless. Blade length is like maybe an inch and a quarter or so. And it has a little lip that curves around. So um, like let's say I put soles on and I need to trim. Um, the outsole flush with the welt. I could use my like five in one, my hand crank, you know, cutting machine to do that. Or I could grab my, my handy dandy lip knife and do that. And I use this for a ton of stuff for like, um, I don't know, trimming heels or especially like working in the shank, um, to make, you know, a really nice sole edge, you know, kind of carving and sculpting with this. And I love this knife. This one's made by, um, Terry Nipshield. Um, and this is stainless and it's really hard to sharpen, but it holds an edge for a long time. And so I have had this knife for six years. I bought it two months after I started and I actually bought it from Lisa, um, cause she was selling them at the bootmakers convention in Wichita falls. And, um, I have sharpened it one time and it holds an edge for a really long time. So to bring the edge back out, instead of actually sharpening it on a stone, I just grab my strop and kind of, you know, work it back and forth on my strop. But most of the time I have a, like I have a bench grinder with a uh, metal polishing wheel, like a jeweler's polishing wheel fitted on there that has jeweler's rouge on it. And so to bring the edge back out on this, I just walk over to the, to the uh, polishing wheel and rouge it up real quick and then the edge is back and I'm good to go. And I can cut, you know, quarter inch hard, dry sole leather like all day long with that. But I don't know. I feel like every shoemaker, bootmaker is also a tool nerd at heart. So I have like a, you know, I have a huge stash of stuff that I love to grab and kind of nerd out on. And I just bought a file, a hand stitched file. And I'm going to butcher this name, but it's Logier or Leogier. I don't know. It's a French, um, file and rasp company and like if you are following any um like english or, or japanese or french or whatever any shoemakers that are doing traditional traditional wooden lasts um and they're you know actually like building and carving the lasts from a block chances are they're using one of these files and they make them in a whole bunch of different shapes big ones small ones whatever so i just ordered my first one Actually, it's, it's been a while. It's been a couple of months, but it's it's almost here now. And they're hand stitched and they're beautiful. Um, so I'm I'm very excited to add that to my collection. I'll probably order a few more. Boot guy who's a gear guy. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a pro it's a problem. <laughs> um, so that's the kit, and yeah, I think it. As I understand, which I you'll realize I don't understand this, which is why I'm going to ask. Maybe it doesn't apply to this, but when we spoke with Lisa on her episode, we talked about her just remarkable inlay and overlay work, which at least one of those techniques, I mean, you mentioned inlay earlier, is something that, that you also use to great effect. And we had her describe it, which opened up a ton of understanding for me. Um, I still don't think I get it. And I watched her videos, <laughs> like the whole thing. Um, you know, we've got, I don't know if you can show us something, uh, you know, now that we're on video, but you know, how, how do you describe that? Like, I know what the end result is and it's, you know, 
pretty astonishing and it's not stitching obviously but yeah like what how how would you put it what what is that like these boot tops that i've made like let's just take for example if you look at a photo of these big ben boots there's a little armadillo in one corner right so i've got some like jasmine colored kangaroo and uh side note this is actually from lisa um this is something that she sells so this um armadillo I wanted to, you know, like inlay this image, right? So or I wanted to put this this image, this character of an armadillo on these boots. So I can do it in a couple of different ways. I can cut a bunch of, you know, the pieces that I need to construct the armadillo, right? I'll use a couple of different browns, maybe some black for the eyes or whatever. And I'll um I'll cut them different shapes and I'll kind of sew them together. And I could make the final overall shape of this armadillo with his little legs and his ears and his tail. And then I could lay it on top of that yellow um, and stitch around it. Just like, uh, it's like when you're making like Christmas ornaments when you're a kid, you know, like the fuzzy ones and you kind of like take little bits of felt and you, you know, cut some triangles and put them together to, to make a tree. So that was, that was the breakthrough for me. Okay. The little okay. felt Christmas ornaments. Yeah. Yeah, totally. yeah. I like, I feel like that's the best way to describe it is um, it's that easy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can you could just drop him right on top and stitch him down. Um, basically, just like make him off site, you know, like away from the final location where the armadillo will reside, and then put it where it's going to go. Stitch it down, overlay. Like these are circumstantial. Sometimes the situation calls for one rather than the other, but I prefer inlay most of the time, um, mainly because you don't get as much bulk above like whatever the surface is so i don't have like little edges that are sticking up that i'm going to catch on so like if i if i take a piece of leather and i lay it on top of another piece and i sew around the edge of that top piece there's going to be like a little tiny rib right around the that i can like feel with my finger like outside of the stitch right it's like a little flap but if i take that first piece of leather if i take like a big piece of yellow right i've got this yellow foreground desert scene and i know that I, I i know what shape i want the armadillo to be in and i cut that shape out of the yellow so at this point there's just the silhouette of the armadillo on this yellow there's nothing behind it then i take my different browns and i construct kind of like a vague oversized armadillo and then i insert the armadillo behind that empty silhouette in the yellow and he appears into view and then I stitch him down. I can take that piece of yellow and I can put him back behind the armadillo. And then once I put everything together and I stitch it, I'll put a stitch kind of uh, like on the border between the armadillo and the yellow and it'll help suck that middle piece up top. So it'll kind of like, we, we called it the relleno or like the filler or whatever, um, but it'll make it puff. It'll like give dimension to whatever the image is that you're creating. So like, if I just took, um, if I just made that armadillo and even if I just inlaid it and sewed it, whatever, it would look kind of flat. But um, if I put that piece back in from the backside and I do my stitching or whatever, that back piece like pushes the armadillo out and like gives it some volume. It gives it some depth. Like it makes it look, I don't want to say realistic, but um, it just like, I don't know, it gives it some interest. Um, I like inlay because I, I feel like I get a cleaner image at the end. Um, and it can really stack stuff, you know, like I can do lots and lots of layers. Um, whereas if I, if I build that with overlay, I don't know, sometimes things get a little funky. I, I don't know. But if you look at, you look at a picture of the Big Ben boots and, and you look at the mountains, actually like all of this is overlay. All of this stuff is overlay. All these things are just laid on top of each other, you know, by like an eighth or a quarter of an inch and then stitched down and I kind of built it and then assembled it in. But then if you look at like the UFO with the little tractor beam and stuff, after I had built all the mountains and the sky, then I cut this shape of the UFO out of all that. And I put the UFO and the tractor beam and stuff in from behind. Anyway, I don't know. I, th I feel like it's just kind of up to whoever's making it. Um, there's a time and a place for, for both of them. And you got to have kind of both in your, in your toolbox, so to speak. Um, but, I, but it's so much fun because you can make anything. Uh, you can use uh, flat brown kind of ordinarily boring pieces of leather and turn them into something really cool. Or you can use like metallic kid skin or I don't know, 
you could use canvas or you could even do like chain stitch embroidery. That's something I'm working on, like to have, like use a piece of um, leather that's been chain stitched as an inlay piece to like add some like texture and interest, like popping through another, another piece on top. Nice, man. Yeah. Dimension is the word that you said. Like that's, I think a great way to put it. Um, <clears throat> that makes a ton of sense. Toe bugs, or I believe you referred to them as toe flowers earlier. What do I not know about them? It's probably a lot, but you know, kind of go deeper. Is there like a history or a language to them? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so did you know that toe flowers are functional? They're not just decorative. Tell me why. Okay. They can be functional. I should say that because a lot of times, especially if you look at a factory boot, they're in a location that lends them just to be decorative, but um, uh, toe flowers are, are really cool because they are, there's something interesting to look at when you look down, like they're, they are a decorative piece, but the purpose that they serve is they control wrinkles, um, going across the vamp. So if I have a totally plain pair of boots, there's no toe flower, there's no wingtip, whatever, there's no toe cap, anything like that. Um, wrinkles are just going to go wherever they want to go, right? They're going to go left, right, crisscross, you know, sometimes people will try and control them with like a brass rod and they'll kind of wrinkle them up in the right spot or a pencil or something like that. Toe flowers, um, aside from being decorative, they control that. So they send wrinkles. I don't know if we can see this in the video, but if you look at this one, I've got a few cords up front and then there's a gap and then there's a few more cords and then we kind of get up onto like the waist or the instep of the person's foot. So right here where these ribs are, um, and there's like cording inside on the back of those, like on the, between the vamp and the lining. Um, it's not going to wrinkle right there, right? That's really stiff. So it's going to take whatever tendency that this vamp has to wrinkle and it's going to direct it right in this little empty valley right across. So I'm going to get one wrinkle right here and then I'm going to get one right there behind that last cord going up on like to the waist. Um, so... I mean, it makes it look better. It's, it's interesting. It's cool to look at. It's another location for you to design something, you know, like kind of put your own spin on it. Like lots of people have really interesting and wild toe flowers. Ray Jones, an old Texas boot maker is like that. He has a very, very recognizable toe flower. It's huge. Kind of reminds you of like a longhorn cow, you know, because it has these big wings that kind of, kind of horns, I guess, that kind of come backwards towards the back of the boot. And then one long point that goes up to the toe. So, I, I mean, I like them. I like them a lot. Mine's, mine is fairly um, subtle, I guess is, is maybe the word. It's, um, it's subdued. I like generally like to match toe flower stitching color to the vamp unless somebody really wants something loud right there. And I, I like kind of a, a calm style when it comes to the toe flower. Um, some people get pretty crazy with it. I think that's, I think that's cool. But um, I mean, toe flowers are... They're something that sets cowboy boots apart from other footwear. But if you look at a shoe with a toe cap or uh, I don't know, a wingtip or, or something like that, like it's a similar principle. Like this isn't something new to the world of footwear that cowboy boots like provided. It's just like a different way to accomplish something that like people were already trying to do. So do most boot makers have a signature toe flower and that's what you get? Or is it something that is, is customized, you know, especially in the, you know, the kind of like high-end custom work that you do? For the most part, people have like a signature toe flower. They might have a few to choose from. Um, but like I have one that's mine. Um, it is it is not like too dissimilar from a lot of other ones, frankly, and like a very kind of like classic design. Um, it has a few different, like there's, there's kind of a nod to um, a vintage one that I really like. And there's a nod to a Ray Jones toe flower in there, but like overall, like it's, it's pretty subdued, but it is mine. Um, if somebody didn't like it and they wanted a new one, then like I might design a different one, but they're um, like being that they are kind of functional. Like they, uh, they take a little, they take a lot of effort to create something that like achieves both of those purposes. Interesting. Yeah. See, didn't know any of that. Um, all right, man. Last one. This is the easy one. In an interview with Jennifer June in 2019, you quoted uh, famed Texas bootmaker Alan Bell, mm -hmm. who said, A good bootmaker should never be totally happy with their work. Mm -hmm. What are you happy with at this point? And, and what are you just 
hopping mad at yourself about. Oh man. Yeah, I uh I believe that. I, I really do. Alan Bell is uh an incredible character. He's a great bootmaker, like a staple in the community, but um that was the I maybe the first time I met him, he told me that. And I think about that honestly, like every day that I'm in the shop because I'm not a perfectionist. Like I think I'm a reasonable person when it comes to my work, but I am very, very, very critical of myself. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing if I can control it, which most of the time I can. And some days I can't, you know, some days there's just something that I can't stop looking at and I just have to like stop and redo it, take it apart, you know, or, you know, remake something. But what am I really happy about? I mean, honestly, like I'm really happy about these the the Big Ben stuff. Um, like I'm really proud of the detail that I was able to accomplish in that inlay. I'm really proud of the design work that went into it. And I'm I'm proud that I was able to like do good work, execute it cleanly, um, but also like put um kind of my voice into it, um, which is not always something that's easy to do. Um I don't think I'm going to tell you what I'm not proud of because I'm not sure that I want to give that secret away. <laughs> I mean, I could, I could, I could pick out like 10 things on every boot that I've made that I'm unhappy with. Um, like I think my personal scale of like how, how good I did goes up to like, I mean, the scale goes up to 10, but I think realistically like my, my 10 is like an eight and a half or like a nine. And, uh, but I, I don't know. I think that's good. Like, I think like if you're not critical of your work, like nobody else knows what goes into it. No one can look at it. I mean, even, even other ex like I'm not an expert, but like even people who have been around whatever field we're talking about, cowboy boots forever and could recognize good work. Like even they are not going to notice every little thing about your work. Um, they're complicated products, man. Like yeah. there's a lot going on there. Yeah, they're they're dynamic. You know, there's a lot of different things that go into this. Um, you know, there's geometry and there's pattern making and there's artistry and some of it. A, a lot of it is cosmetic and a lot of it is functional. Um, so, I, I don't know. I think at the end of the day, like I just I want to know that I did the best that I can do and pick out a few things that I can improve on. Um, and that's you know that's something that Lee taught me. And he has been making boots since like 1970. I don't even remember 75, 74, something like that. Like since he was a kid and um, still, I'm sure he would say that he could pick something out of his latest pair that he could improve on. And I think like, I don't, I don't really believe in the concept of a master craftsperson. And I think m like most people that I know who are really incredible craftspeople who are excellent boot makers, like at the top of their game, I think most of them wouldn't say that they're masters, that they'd mastered their craft because they are so good and they are at the top of their game because they are constantly learning and looking for something to improve on. But at the end of the day, like I make every pair of boots for myself because um, like I want to be happy with the work when it leaves. Like I want to be proud of what I did. So I don't know. I guess that's my... That's my standard. But yeah, I'm not going to tell you what I'm unhappy about because then you'll be able to see it. I bet you get good at this one day. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Just I keep it's pushing. A, Just, it's, a, yeah. it's a skill. Like It's definitely a mark of maturity to be able to recognize that your work is good or improving. Um, but I think it's really important to like have the humility to recognize that you still, no matter how long you've been doing it or how good it is, or how many likes you get or comments or whatever on a photo or how many people tell you how much they love them. Like at the end of the day, like you can always improve on something. And I think that's really important that, I don't know, for me anyway. I love it, man. Um, look, got to call it somewhere. Huge thanks to Grant Stone for sponsoring this episode. Wyatt and crew will be holding it down at boot camp this October in New York uh, and would love to hang. So get your tickets today at stitchdown.com. Graham, thank you so much for this, taking us inside your world. Absolutely. This was really fun. Thank you for having me. All right, that's it for this week. Take care of your shoes. We'll see you next time.